Okay, good morning everyone. Um, thanks for joining. Today the main agenda item is um, our uh, presentation from Shane, um, who is from the Agile Labs, uh, and is going to talk to us about the, um, the long term project which um, he is submitting as a uh, sandbox project. We have, uh, we, we, um, Shane has filled in information on our questionnaire and it has um, it, uh, given us a lot of link to the presentation. Alex, it, it's really hard to hear you. Oh, sorry. C can you hear me better now? Yeah, much better. Sorry. Um, so, so Shane has put together the information for the Longhorn project um, and filled out the questionnaire as well as uh, put together a presentation which we have linked in the agenda document. So, so they're, they're available for, for sort of background reading too. Um, and unless there are any other immediate questions, I think, I think Shen, uh, please go ahead and start. Sure. Okay. All right, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see the screen. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Right. So, uh, thanks for coming, Six Storage. And my name is Xuan Yang. I'm working for Rancher Labs. And uh, for the last few years, I've been working on this uh, open source distributed block storage software for Rancher Labs called Longhorn. So today I'll be glad to uh, present you Longhorn and tell you more about it. So, um, sorry, I probably got a little bit cold last night. So. My sound, sound probably get a little bit hoarse. And uh, also, if you have any questions, you can just free to interrupt me during my presentation. All right. So we started Longhorn in late 2014 at the Rancher Labs. I think it's about September. Um, and the, the motivation we started is we want to have uh, open source dispute block storage software for containers. But what this makes is different is, is we want it to be simpler, simpler in the way that is the, should be simpler than the Ceph, which we know that is the basically uh, the most popular open source storage software out there. Uh, but we have checked, um, uh, we didn't really, we are not really a Ceph expert. But uh, we have uh, have seen many users using Ceph and found it's very difficult to operate. It requires certain knowledge to really operate Ceph correctly. And uh, that is why we started Longhorn. So Longhorn itself has been adapted by OpenEBS as one of their storage backend back in March 2017. And uh, I think that is one, uh, one, one of the proof is that uh, Longhorn is really the uh, at least targeting as uh, enterprise grade storage software, and and uh, this type of technology has been adapted by other companies and they use it for their own product. And also that demonstrate our um, our embrace for the open source uh, open source models. So Longhorn all of the old Longhorn's code are licensed in Apache 2.0, and uh, if you want to know more about the licensing and the external library dependency, you can check the document or our PR to the CNCF TOC. All right, so why we build the Longhorn? As I mentioned before, we believe that the distributed storage software doesn't have to be really that complex. Uh, the reason is the if we have, if you would consider that the modern high speed, high capacity SS, uh, the existence of SSD NVMe, and we can think that probably the, the one thing we get away with is uh, not doing striping across the different disks. And uh, because the high capacity is mostly have the, already have the enough space for the user to use, and also the striping is, in fact, the most complex part of the storage, you know, like in the staff. 
So if we get away without doing it and it still provides value to the users, we found that should be a what uh, should be the uh, build of storage software should be much simpler. And also we use proven uh, Linux storage features like sparse file, and uh, we're planning to do QoS with VRC groups and in the future. So that's, uh, that's made us not unnecessary to uh, rebuild and re rebuild our full stack from ground. We utilize the mature and uh, existing technology to do a lot of features rather than just build, rather than just write them by ourselves. And uh, in long course model, each volume is just a set of independent microservices. And now it's orchestrated by the Kubernetes. Longhorn's uh, management plan, uh, management plan, local manager is totally run on top of Kubernetes and it follows Kubernetes controller model to write a bunch of controllers and uh, uh, control and orchestrate the flows, upgrade the flow of creating, deleting, and operating Longhorn volumes. So currently, Longhorn is the most of the code, most of the code is writing in Go. The currently functional code, which excludes the testing part, is about 30,000 lines of Go code. And that's including the data plan, which is the local engine, and the manager plan, which is local manager. So the data plan, we can, okay. I will talk about more about the architecture of the data plan and manager plan later. Uh, so here is the overview of the, what the current local community looks like. We have uh, submit the sandbox PR to the uh, CNCF TOC and the current independent state. And the uh, local has about uh, 600 GitHub stars. And uh, we have made about uh, 23 releases for, for the things we uh, change everything into and rewrote everything on the Kubernetes. And currently we have 200 plus members in the Longhorn storage channel on the Rancher Slack. So one thing I want to emphasize that is uh, our 600 plus GitHub stars is purely organic. We don't, uh, in fact, for the last few years, since Longhorn is still a product in the alpha stage, we don't spend much of marketing effort on that or uh, so basically um, we have some announcements once every uh, month and or uh, once every two months from our rancher official Twitter and uh, announce that new releases or we have new um, uh, demonstrate uh, demo coming and the new master class coming something like that but other than that we don't really have spent we don't really have spent much um, marketing effort on marketing the Longhorn. But so many of these um, users for the Longhorn is really just coming from, they, they try to find the story solutions and they, they compiled all the other solutions out there and open source ones. And uh, they, they found that it's very easy to get into Longhorn. So that's, that's how we um, basically really just organic uh, grow that. So this um, community right, right now. So after we got, uh, we are going to announce a long home beta and uh, we're targeting GA by the end of this year. And uh, after that, we'll spend much more effort on the marketing and the, because we want to make sure that our product is ready and the uh, user friendly and the user, um, we are going, um, and the user going to, is going to really like it and it really can depends on us to uh, trust their data to us. So that's, that's is when we will try to launch our full uh, marketing campaign. But for now, that's just, uh, we are, uh, you heard of the, the, the project in the ranchers like uh, K3S, K3OS, and the, all this on the real, and we don't really have in this much, much marketing effort than that, but once we reach a beta and the GA, we will we'll do more. And I, I will expect this number to be grow substantially. Can I can I interrupt briefly with a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, I was just curious. Uh, is it correct that you've been working on this for five years now, roughly? Ah, uh, yes. So I was just curious. I mean, five years is a long time to still be in alpha. Um, what what was the reason for it taking so long? Okay, so the first thing is we rewrote the whole thing. So the first implementation 
is uh, basically scrapped off uh, at early 2016 because that's why it's, we, we still think the first implementation is way too complex. It's, it's working in C and C++. So we basically just get rid of it and just start from scratch and write, rewrote everything in Go. And that is 2016. And in the 2017, we officially announced the project. And, but you know, uh, in fact, when we built the Longhorn for in the 2016, that's uh, we're targeting is really at the rancher. Uh, sorry, not the rancher, but Docker. So in um, 2017, we announced uh, when the first version we announced uh, uh, Longhorn 4. We see the starting of uh, uh, Kubernetes, but uh, it's really, really ramp up very fast. So, but at the time, the 2017 Kubernetes hasn't become, uh, I think it's on the way to become the universal application platform, but haven't, it hasn't reached there yet. So at the time we are building on premises of Docker and we still require some external storage to do um, external storage uh, uh, to store the state, right? And about in the 2018, we basically did a rewrite at the management plane again, because we see that we can utilize Kubernetes to um, uh, for all many, many Longhorns capability. So we basically just rewrite the management plane and solely focus on the Kubernetes. And that is how you see, you're going to see what's the architecture right now is basically solely based on the Kubernetes. So since we uh, fully rewrite to, uh, um, fully rewrite again and targeting Kubernetes, this has been about one year. And in fact, this 20 something releases is all happened this year, happened in doing this one year, one year and, a, year and a half period. So after that, I think we progress is pretty decent, but the thing is we really want to make sure that the users can trust their data to us because storage is really, really important. They, you cannot, um, the, the worst thing is not that your uh, one volume is offline or what, that's, that is really bad, but the worst thing is you lost data somehow. So we really want user, um, there are many, we have many great user feedbacks, but also we want to make sure that the many user tried it and uh, they are not, there's not a case we aware of that Longhorn lost your data. I know that, that in fact, this GitHub, there's one case that uh, one user accidentally deleted one replica, which he think is faulted, but that replica happened to contain the last piece of uh, really the uh, usable data for his volume. That is only that is the uh, that is one known data loss at the time, and we immediately patch it up. We basically just say that even this replica is supported, and uh, we don't allow user to delete it if it contains just the last piece of the known data. So that's that's the some things we we put efforts on the usability, and we put effort on make things as stable. So that's that's why it's taking really long time. And also, of course, we have a few rewrite. And uh, in fact, another story is that we also changed the front end. And uh, that's also, and that's another long story if you want to talk about it. Yeah, but- uh, you, no, no, that, that answers my question. Thanks very much. Okay. I don't want to derail the, the, the presentation. Okay. All right. So yeah, that's continuing. So, uh, so currently Longhorn offers the enterprise grade distributed block storage software um, as uh, so when, and also Longhorn offers a volume snapshot and building, building volume backup and restore support. The difference between the snapshot and the backup here is a snapshot is the, the snapshot you made in the in cluster for the in cluster volumes. So whatever you made snapshot is stay in the cluster, but uh, when you do a backup, we allow you to backup your volume to the third party like uh, S3 or S3 compatible object store like Menu or NFS. So in this way, user even user lost its whole whole cluster and they still have access to their data. So in, in long form, this is one uh, one we uh, one part differentiate us from other many other solutions. So we do the backup and the restore by ourselves. And we did that in the incremental way uh, because we want that 
we want we think backup backup is very important for the safety of the user's data. So we want we want to provide first party support to that. So uh, that is so. That is one uh, key point of that. What makes the Longhorn different? Another point is uh, currently Longhorn we can do live upgrade without worrying downtime, even on data plan. So I can explain more how we did that later. And we support cross cluster disaster recovery with the defined RTO and RPO. That is also achieved by with the help of uh, um, the, our backup store, which is the location you you backup your volumes. Longhorn provide intuitive UI as a big, that's in fact just the the first thing many users notice about Longhorn is we provide dashboard and the full functionality UI to expose all the Longhorn's uh, uh, functionalities and you can really operate easily when you see the UI and it's really intuitive. Many users like it and the, that's probably the that's one of the one of the reasons why they get into Longhorn lock, like Longhorn if Longhorn is even still in the alpha stage. And the Longhorn is built as a Kubernetes native application. That means that we are uh, using controller pattern on CRD for the management plane, and you can install Longhorn just using one line of the Kube control apply or Helm installation. And Longhorn runs on any Kubernetes cluster, and uh, one thing to make note here that is uh, when we see that you can do one line installation use scope control apply dash f that's we do we really mean it because you know um, there's many devils in the details so um, many many storage vendors claim that or applications they claim that okay you can just use uh, one line store and then you can just use the Kube control apply dash f but they, you have to choose all kind of options and make like uh, tell you what the Kubernetes version is, what the driver is, and what option you want to make. And you have to field in this and the, they generate the YAML file for you. So we, we spend much effort in the, the, to make it easier for user to access Longhorn. So many mechanisms, all the mechanisms, we basically we just building automatic detection, like uh, what is your, uh, especially on the driver part, like the, in the CSI, we. We basically uh, we are going to deploy different versions of CSI depends on what your Kubernetes version is, and uh, if your Kubernetes is too old, we are going to deploy flex warning. And uh, for in the each cases, we are going to detect that what is the correct directory for Longhorn to install the driver, so you can the, your Kubernetes can uh, connect to Longhorn correctly. So that's why we basically we detect the Kubernetes version, the distributed version, and the, anything we can and to make sure that we minimize the burden of the configuration to the user and to make sure that the user can easily start using Longhorn. All right. So this is the Longhorn architecture for the data plan, which we call the engine. Assuming that you have two nodes here, each node has a bunch of disks and RAM and CPU. So one part was asking for one volume and the Longhorn will receive that request and they will start, uh, Longhorn will start two replicas and each replica will place as one uh, SSD on the two different nodes because we want to make sure that if one node goes down, the, the volume should still works as long as there's another running replicas. And we'll start a Longhorn engine, which is also the name for the microcontroller Longhorn uh, Longhorn engine is, and the Longhorn engine we are going to connect to the replicas, and the Longhorn engine we are going also going to expose a block device on the host on the node, and the, that block device will be used by the Kubernetes CSI driver, and the CSI driver are going to format it and mount it to the one directory on the on the node, and the, that directory we are going to bind mount into the pod as uh, using as the warning for the pod. So as you see it here, the architecture is very easy with the Longhorn data plan. But if we have uh, multiple volumes, we're just going to just start multiple replicas and engines, and uh, everything will be the same. So another benefit of this architecture is the data path is the isolated, is isolated uh, within the, between the different volumes. So if anything happens to a data path of the one volume, the other volume is not really going to get affected. 
but how do you, how can we op operate and orchestrate all these end-to-end replicas? So that is uh, the how the Kubernetes coming into the picture. So those engine and the replicas are all orchestrated by the Kubernetes. I will explain more in the next slide. So, um, Shane, quick question. Yeah. So, so each of those um, engine and replica instances, they are um, separate individual containers uh, in, in this case, therefore? Yeah, so uh, we conceptually, we design them to be separate instances. And uh, the current implementation in the long-run set 5.0 is the separate part. So we're basically, we're starting one part per engine and one part per replicas. But uh, as you know, this, as you can realize, that will quickly become a problem because uh, the Kubernetes have a limitation of the 110 parts per node. So we already have some user hits that on a very large Kubernetes node, uh, Kubernetes node. So in the next release, we're doing a small, we're doing architecture. Uh, we're going to uh, re-architecture on the how uh, the engine the replica started, and the, in the next release, we're going to start them as the process instead of a container, um, instead of pod. And the one pod will contain the multiple process, and the, in fact, on the node there will be one node, uh, one pod contain the engines, another pod contain the replicas. And the inside inside that pod, the replicas are also are still access as uh, independent separate processes and engine is also separated. So that's that's how we are going to solve this um, uh, exhausting the pod members on the node problem. I see. Okay, and and the the replica is effectively the 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 process that actually writes to the back end disk, whereas the engine provides the the front end. Um, sort of SCSI device yeah, and right. that, that gets mounted. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a correct. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. It, if I can provide some advice, yeah. um, uh, GlusterFS had the same model where they had a process per volume, mm -hmm. so processes per bricks, what they call it. And um, in the end, uh, when, they, when we tried to, when I was part of the project and we tried to containerize it and so on, we noticed that it was consuming a lot of memory for many thousands of volumes. So instead, they, what we called, was called it, uh, they call it multiplexing. They would, in other words, a single process was able to handle many volumes. Um, so just something to think about as you uh, support thousands and thousands of volumes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, the, the reason is, um, so basically the, uh, on the, at first we are doing it on the pod because that's, uh, it seems a very obvious choice because everything else is Kubernetes. And then we hit the limit of net 110. So we decided to do that as the process. And in fact, we also, we also thought about uh, multiplexing, but uh, um, I just want, uh, we, we are not sure how complex that thing will be because um, they were also, because when you do multiplexing, we go to the same processes, we, we can imagine that will take much more effort than just running on our existing uh, framework using single, thing, using single instance for each engine and replicas. But yeah, definitely no, I, I definitely think that's something we need to consider. And uh, if we are designing um, for say each node, we're going to have thousands of the volumes um, I think now we have each node has, a, we, we're talking around uh, some hundreds because we are block storage. But uh, if each node we are talking more than that, we, are, oh, we are, of course we are going to consider that uh, how to do multiplexing and async using one process handle more uh, requests. Of course, that's well, you are safe the memories and uh, you will be more efficient. But uh, which, uh, at this moment, uh, we think that handling process is uh, good, but of course we're going to take that into consideration if uh, um, in the future we are going to uh, meet more high, um, the larger numbers of volumes used by, uh, using by the pod, using by the nodes. Yeah, just, just one, one additional uh, related comment, um, that even independently of how many of these volumes you have, um, essentially to provision, uh, to provide a, a piece of block store um, you're, you're consuming, you know, RAM and CPU as well. 
And those yeah. are vastly more expensive than the actual storage. So, I mean, that, that's the other motivation, irrespective yeah, of what yeah, you no, know, no. end up with very, very expensive yeah. storage because, because there's so much cost tied up in the RAM and the CPU. Yeah, so I, I think currently we, uh, the RAM, the, the RAM consumption of our current engine, the replicas is okay. And, but the CPU, sometimes when you are uh, running, uh, of course, we are running press, some uh, pressure tests and benchmarks, the CPU, CPU realization is something we need to deal with. So yeah, so in fact, we, um, we, thought, we thought a lot about uh, if we want to keep the single instance and the multiple instance and, and or one instance handling uh, multiple requests. Um, in the end, for now, we just, we wanted it to be simpler and uh, we want it to be at least uh, reliable. And um, in the current stage, because we have spent much effort and the user has tried this many times. So at least uh, it seems stable for now. And, but in the future, of course, if it's needed, we, we definitely have to change to that model. If we're, uh, if it's really, uh, it's really, um, it's really needed for the larger scale. So that's, um, yeah, I can think that's, that's probably uh, one thing we have to address in the future. Yeah, but, uh, but not just now, currently we think this model is sufficient enough for the, for the current usage. Thanks. That that answers that question. Uh, I'm also quite curious about how your replication algorithm between the replicas works. Uh, are you going to cover that later, or? or uh... well, I think I would announce. So the the, the replica, uh, in fact, it's very simple. Quite a very simple answer to that. Everything is synchronized on the replica part. We do the synchronized application. Each replica is the same as any other replica. It's supposed to be the same. Yeah. So we we are um, so when any instructions sent by the engines. And the replica, and the engine will wait for replica to confirm that it's written before it's uh, before it's um, uh, response back to the block layer and say that this this block has been written. Okay, so so that was sort of my question. Um, if you have if you have two replicas, for example, um, yeah. of, a, of a block, um, or I guess it's a volume that you replicate, not the actual blocks, um, then then you've essentially you know, doubled or, or multiplied by a very large amount the the failure probability, because if you can't get to either replica or the network between them, you uh, the volume is essential. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, the engine itself has the de detect mechanism for the replica. So, the if a replica doesn't respond or doesn't confirm the right within a certain time limit, the engine will just cut it off, and the, the manager will start another replica and start rebuilding process. Yeah, but we know, we know that the, the, the replication is definitely the, the worst, the, the data intensive and also the, the CPU intensive part. So that's, that's uh, but the thing is we, um, at least for now, we didn't, we, we, we want to keep these things simple. And also we, we cannot think about the better way, say, because the long run was designed to be a crash consistent storage. So if we are not, if we have a beauty something like locality, that means that uh, there were definitely going to be a difference between the local replicas and the remote replicas. And uh, there will be much more things need to be deal with that on, on that area. So I, I think for now that's we just we just going to have to buy into this um, uh, uh, amplify the right or re amplify the right problem and uh, we'll we can and see if we can improve that in the future. A uh, couple more questions, <clears throat> excuse yeah. me. Yeah. Um, the pods that consume any volume can only be scheduled to one of the two nodes that the replicas exist on? Oh, no. So, um, yeah. If, so, basically, the, uh, the, the nodes that provide the storage to the Longhorn is not the same node that can use the storage. So, the, basically, what we deploy is we're going to deploy in the next cluster, and the uh, the replica doesn't need to be on the same node as the consumer, but the engine has to be on the same node. Got it. Uh, and second question is how are, or actually, uh, are you constrained by the size of the smallest, uh, basically, uh, disk? Disk for, for provisioning new volumes? Uh, yes. Okay. And then third question, how do you 
discover the local disks to use? Oh, so uh, the local disk is uh, discovered by the user need to specify that which paths of in the local uh, file system they mounted on the new disk. So uh, we do have uh, we do have building some error detection in case user want to double counting and we of course we don't want to double counting. Say you're using the same file system for say two different directories, but basically what user need to do to add a new disk is to format that disk and mount that in the one path of the uh, direct up to the node directory and tell them more about that where the disk is. And uh, last question is, do you uh, support raw block or only file on block? Oh yeah, so uh, we, are, we are working on that. The raw block is haven't been supported yet and currently we're uh, providing um, uh, the file system on top of a block device where the, uh, through the CSI. Yeah, so that's okay. it. That's something we, we we are going to get it in. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you. I I, I have a following question. Yeah. Um, you said that the engine is always with the volume. Ah uh, yes, engine is always with the the volume, which is the uh, which is at the same node as the pod is running. Okay, so that means that um, the engine is the one doing. So in other words, Longhorn does client side replication instead of server-side replication, is that correct? Sorry, what's this, uh, what do you mean by client-side replication? Client-side replication means um, that the client, meaning where the volume is being requested or being used, uh, uh, when a write goes down to the, the, the IO, the, mm -hmm. the client is the one that's copying the data to two different nodes. Is that the way it works? Uh, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. You can. Yeah, I, th I think it's. Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, because if you think of engine as client, yeah, the engine engine is going to uh, write a two copy of the data into two replicas. Yeah. Okay, because again, th this is again very close to Gluster, um, and Gluster has client side replication, and mm -hmm. and one of the issues with client side replication, especially specifically with replica two is mm -hmm. um, you're gonna you may get a lot of uh, split brain so um, one of the, the things that they wanted to do in cluster is do server side replication like Ceph does surface server side replication and then that way the server can then decide uh, when to send the the replicas and how to log the replicas and so on you may have a lot more power there uh, so it's just something else to think about than doing end client side replication. Uh, so you're talking about so you think uh, sorry. Uh, if I understand correctly, Luis, you said that client side replication will lead to sleep uh, sleep uh, split out the brain. It may yes, and actually through many years, uh, Gluster has been trying to deal with split brain, um, and uh, so one of oh, the solutions is to use server side replication. Right? Oh, okay. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I understand what you mean, but uh, I think the thing is a little bit different here because cluster FS is a distributed file system. Your uh, client have to be run at every node to provide service, and uh, yeah, for the for the Kubernetes, you are read write many, right? But the block as a block device, the long uh, block device provider, Longhorn is a read write once type. Uh, service so we are uh, storage so we are unable to provide storage in one node so in that node the, the sense is that the engine is the one on that node so of course it's the only one engine on that node and there's no other um, engines connect to the replicas so uh, the split up brain is the, not a problem here it could be true okay yeah thank you thank you yeah I think I uh, actually had some other comments, similar stuff. The, the, so I think I think the split brain actually is independent of whether it's client side or server side replication, or, or, or you have you have similar problems in both cases. Um, and I, and I can you know I don't want to go into too much detail now, but you can imagine many different cases where the network uh, connection from uh, yeah. pod one is is uh, intermittently failing, and yeah. then you know you you try and write to both those replicas, but you don't know which replicas you wrote to, uh, unless you have a fairly sophisticated protocol like Paxos or something to figure out, you know, which is the master replica and which one is considered to be true, etc. Um, okay. Yeah. So 
yeah. it's, it's very problematic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I understand. So the uh, currently we uh, the first that is currently the the status replica, the single point of choose is coming from the engine, and the second thing is the uh, is uh, currently we detected the the failure is basically just depends on okay. So if engine think this replica is bad, is bad. So at least we know that if and the and the, also we know that which replica is the last one received the written from written command from the engine since we are going to have only one engine. So um, so in in that sense we kind of mitigate that just the this split up brain problem. No, I think you still have the problem because you can send a request. The replicas can get written, but you don't know whether they got written because the response gets lost. And so the engine doesn't know which replica got written and which one didn't. Uh, yeah, but in fact, uh, in that case, we currently, we just simply drop that replica, which doesn't really respond and continue with other replicas. Yeah, if, if the network error is on the client end, like the pod one has a bad network connection, then both the replicas go bad. From the point of view of the engine, both the replicas go bad at the same time. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that that's also happens. That's coming with our, so we, we have a failure or fail over, uh, or sorry, not fail over, but just uh, uh, we, it, so basically if engine think every replica is bad, of course, engine will go, go down. And uh, uh, we have a, we just have some other mechanism when the engine slows down and the, the volume market is afforded, uh, we can take a look into the replicas and try to figure out which one is really the recent written and which one contains the most data, most written. So that's one will be choose as the, uh, as the choose, choose as the choose for this data and the represent the state for the data. So that's, um, and also, and then the engine can start with that replica and start rebuilding. Yeah, but, but now I, I perfectly understand this is really complex problems and we, uh, we're trying out, and also, so we're trying our best to, to get this working, and in the case that two replicas are both failed, but unfortunately, if the two replicas both failed, we, we uh, the engine probably going to shut down, and uh, the pod will lost the access to the water, and the pod probably will need to restart. Okay, th thank you, that makes sense. And just just a warning, I guess that yeah, yeah. the whole process you're describing there, you basically end up implementing Paxos, <laughs> deciding which one is the master, and and uh, yeah, building all that stuff. Yeah, so okay. so so currently Longhorn just treat every replica the same, not really. So we, we don't have a master concept here. So yeah, okay, all right. Well, wow, that's forty minutes already. Gosh, <laughs> okay. I think I'm probably going to skip a few slides later. Okay, so um, that's about uh, the local engine. Now we talk about uh, how the maintenance plan is going as the, the manager part. And uh, of course, Longhorn is running on top of a Kubernetes cluster. And the one when Kubernetes cluster want to have a volume, a persistent volume created and assigned to one of these part, the Kubernetes cluster, we are going to talk with the CSI and the CSI, we're going to talk with the Kubernetes, uh, sorry, Longhorn CSI plugin, which in turn calls the Longhorn API to the Longhorn manager. And the Longhorn manager, as I said, is the, the one to orchestrate all the volumes. So whenever you create a new volume, Longhorn manager, at the API part, will write, will create a new volume object in the Kubernetes API server using CRD. Sorry. And that the creation of new object will be picked up by the controllers in the local manager as well. And the controller will see, okay, this new volume, this new volume was created and then it needs to be attached to some node. And the controller will start in the engine, the replica process and the dealing with and the dealing with that and the make and the pro, um, compose this local volume to uh, the uh, to the need of the pod. And, and if we have more volumes, we're going to just create a, a, a few more sets of the engine and the replicas to provide the service of that volume. So another way to access to the local manager is of course through the local UI. So local UI complements the functionality of uh, Kubernetes uh, create, delete, and attach, detach, mount, unmount APIs. And currently local UI can do basically everything Longhorn's feature is and uh, they provide the dashboard and uh, 
uh, the snapshot, node management, backup, restore, and uh, add, add, add some more features like cross-class replication. And also we are working on the volume snapshotter and, uh, and also the raw block device support for the Kubernetes. Any questions? All right. So um, this is the one example of the how Longhorn used the Kubernetes controller pattern to uh, achieve the uh, operating operating the Longhorn volumes. For example, we have four nodes here, and uh, one, node one, two, three has three replicas running on that, and engine connects to them, everything seems fine. And uh, what if we somehow lost node three? The replica, the engine will immediately detect that the replica three lost connection, and the uh, the engine will mark now replica three as a folder, and the manager will see that will remove the manager will remove um, replica three from the engines from engine stack. So you can see on the right side the volumes is supposed to have three healthy replicas, but currently you only have a two, since it's only one or two. So the manager will also see okay, there's another node node four which we can put the replica on. So the manager will start a new pod. With, uh, with replica four, in fact, new instance in the later releases, and uh, add that to the engine spec. An engine will going to see that, okay, so now I have two replicas, but I supposed to have three, and the last one is replica four. And the engine will connect to the replica four and starting the rebuilding process. Once the rebuilding process was completed, the replica four will change into the healthy state and everything will be recovered. And also this time, the warning status showing the current healthy replicas will be three. And of course it's matched what's the desired state of the number of replica. So everything back to normal. All right. And just a yeah. very short question on that. So, so effectively the, the state of the, um, of the volume in terms of which replicas are on which nodes and which ones are healthy, et cetera, are actually stored within the, the, the CRD in the Kubernetes API, right? Yeah, so the, the, the CRDs reflects the state. The state was observed from engine. So the engine is still the, the single point of choose in, in this case, yeah. But uh, what we observed in the engine, we are going to stay, uh, store that in the CRD, like in the engine status, and in, like I said, um, listed here in the replica list. Got it. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, I don't know if I have time to go over the engine under the hood. So uh, let me just go through this very quickly. So. Um, as I said, this uh, Longhorn in the end, using the Linux sparse file to store differentiated disks, we currently have 512 byte block size, and uh, the read is lazy feeling. As, let me explain how that works. Yeah, I think for this, I think uh, probably many of you already know how this works. It's, it's uh, the way, very standard way to handle a snapshot. For example, here, uh, the handling the data and with the basis of the snapshot. So for example, the live data always has the highest priority. So we, when we read the block one, we'll read that from the highest priority one, which is live data. And when we read block zero, because live data has no data and the block zero, we're going to read, we're going to check if that data on the newest snapshot. And uh, we found the block there and we read from there. And uh, the block two, we found that, okay, so all the snapshots and the live data doesn't have that block except for the oldest snapshot. So we're going to read from all the snapshot and the, uh, so on the the fourth block is in fact empty, and we search everything, and we found okay, this just no one has this data, so I just written error. We just written now. And also the uh, if you read from the block seven, and the same is from live data, and block three is from the the news snapshot, and the block five is from the yeah the, the middle snapshot, and the six block six from the live data. And if we write a new block, say that user now just write a new block into uh, the volume, and that block is block five, and we're going to update our index and remove that from the original position and rewrite that to the, redirect that to the live data. So next time when user read from, want to read block five, you're going to read from live data. 
just to clarify, uh, which copy on write uh, mechanism are you using? I presume this is just copy on write, so standard. Uh, yeah, so this, uh, we're just using Linux sparse file. And where is your metadata stored for your indexes? Yeah, so the index is stored internally in the, in the Linux sparse file. So there's a, there's a function call called FIE map, which you can get the layout of one sparse file. So that's why uh, Longhorn requires the underlying file system to be XD4 or XFS, which supports the sparse file. If you leave the underlying file system uh, using by Longhorn story cannot do the sparse file, we have no way to know that where the, where the data is. But now, if, if I understand you correctly, a, a read in this example on your slide here, a read might involve like four reads, like a, a single logical read might involve four physical reads. Uh, yes, but uh, whenever after you uh, read the first, first time, you are going to, uh, the, the one, the index will be updated. And uh, so next time we read the same data, we'll know that which one is going to read from. Oh, so the index keeps the, keeps the pointer to the, the actual logical block, the, the yes. physical block representing the logical block. Yes. And does that mean that the index is also kept cached in the engine yeah, for the, the live volume? And then, so there's two, like there's the index of all the snapshots on the replica, right? On each replica. And then there is an index on the engine that has um, the live. So the, okay, so sorry. The, uh, the cache, in fact, is on the, the replica. So, so the thing is the, 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 the cache is in the memory. The cache is in the memory. And every time when the engine wants to read something, the engine will just send a read to one of the replicas. And that replica is having, uh, has the responsibility to keep that where the block should be and which snapshot I should read from. So that that's in memory cache is kind of in the mem it's in the replica, but we didn't store that physically on the disk. So if you reload the volume, you need to do a re the cache will be revisited again. So just a quick question then, doesn't that imply quite a large memory overhead? Because if you had, you know, a volume of a couple of hundred gig in size, for example, doesn't, doesn't that mean that you end up with millions if not hundreds of millions of, of keys in the in the index that, that need to be in memory. We're yeah we store that in the we store that in we're using one byte. We're using one byte for one block. So I need to do redo the calculation, see how much is that. Uh, since, yeah, you're going to you're going to have some memory overhead here. Okay. All right. Yeah if your blocks are five twelve bytes then I guess you've got somewhere around about 0.2% uh, of your disk size will be cached in memory. Yeah, so, um, yes. You may want to increase that to like a, at least 64K or something, and then you'll reduce yeah. the memory pressure. Yeah, so the thing is, the, the, this, this block size 512 here is um, a kind of coincident with uh, the QCAL size. So because we also, uh, support using QCAL file as the base image for your volume. So if you, when you use a QCAL file, you have to align. So we basically just, okay, so we use 512 because QCAL is um, by default 512. But uh, I, th I think it, yeah, I think it's a good idea if we can upsize this to, uh, originally we have 4K and we probably can do even bigger. And, uh, and uh, but we need to measure the, 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 what's the overhead and the compared to the, what's the, um, what's the memory usage is to decide that was the optimal block size. But the thing is this block size is have to be, uh, have to be fixed for the, for one volume. So otherwise it's, uh, we're going to, we, we are not going to have very good time saying that try to figure out where the location of the data is. But, but I guess you have to, there's, there's a compromise there, right? So yeah, yeah, it's compromised. If, if the block size is small, you have large indexes and presumably those indexes grow based on the number of snapshots you have. Yeah. But then if you have a large block size, the index size is smaller, but you have a higher copy on write 
Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah, so you're going to waste more, more space as well. Okay. And we're almost uh, ending, and I was just wondering if this seems a lot of great discussion. Uh, do we want to do this again, or do we want to? How are we going to end it today? Uh, let me see. I think I have almost. I'm almost down. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So this one is the, and the next one I'm talking about just the, in fact, the same concept, and we are doing the, how we do the backup. So the, we do backup in an incremental way, as you see here, and the, the, the right side, the right hand is the, uh, what's the change the blocks in the different snapshot, the left hand is how do we uh, store these blocks in, in the backup. So we, the, in the backup, our block size is two megabytes, and of course, when you do that, you have to convert what is our uh, in-class block size to the backup block size and the calculate new layout. But uh, the, the advantage of that is our stored backup is basically only, only the pointer to the backup blocks. And uh, for, for example, if you see the green blocks coming from the snapshot two, and snapshot should only have a reference to three blocks, one orange block from snapshot one and two green blocks from snapshot two. And uh, when we do a, a backup for the snapshot three, we'll see that, okay, snapshot three is only a differentiation, it's different from how snapshot three is the different from snapshot two, which is already we backed up. So the snapshot three only have two change blocks. So what is really happening is the snapshot three just copy what the metadata of snapshot two is, and plus the change of two, that two blocks and update the reference of the first and second block to the, what's the blocks we copied from snapshot three. So that's we, how we implement the, snap, uh, the incremental a snapshot. Also, the on the disaster recovery volume feature, our backup is also incremental. So that's that's uh, basically it on the, on the how we how we do the back backup and snapshot backup and uh, restore. The, does that mean that your backup feature uses the indexed metadata to determine this information, or or is no, there no, some other? We are that... Well, we are not using. Uh, uh, not index metadata. We are we are uh, if you mean by the reading cache, the reading index, right? We are not using yeah. that part. We are just we are in the backup mechanism. We are going to look into really the layout of the each snapshot. And uh, first, of course, is real world. If the previous snapshot was backed up and still exists, so if the previous snapshot snapshot doesn't exist, it will not work. Uh, so I'm trying to understand where is that metadata kept and how does oh, that work? Is a, it's a still we're looking at the Linux sparse file okay. using that FIE map core and the just uh, real time get the, the layout from that snapshot because snapshot won't change. So there's no risk condition or whatever. So yeah. we got into the snap, we got into, got out of the layout and we calculate that which two blocks, which two megabyte blocks we need to copy and whatever. And we just um, back, back it up and update the, the reference in the new snapshot. I'd love to see, I mean, not in this context of CNCF, but maybe a Longhorn specific talk on just how you guys do snapshots. I'm very curious. Okay, all right, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Luis. Yeah. All right, so uh, the next one is just how bike up a store. This is very simple. We have a configuration for one volume and uh, the volume has two snapshots and uh, the one had five blocks. That's so basically the backups just store the reference to the blocks. All right. So uh, the, this is the last slide. I think this is doing the uh, live upgrade. So uh, what we do is because the front, and we have uh, some, uh, we have a Unix domain socket connect the front end with the engine. And uh, what happens if you want to update the data plan we are going to start another set of uh, engine replicas, and we are going to use the same disk, basically the same location for the data, and make replica point to them. And we are going to just switch. We have a uh, uh, wait for the previously read write to be complete, and uh, just immediately switch to the uh, to the new engine. And uh, after the after the switch is done, the new engine can be done. Can be can be uh, get rid of. Yeah. Oh, sorry, this is a good question. Uh, uh, we didn't talk about how is it that, uh, which is actually a continuation of Saad's question, which was how is it that um, pods that are not on the nodes with the replicas communicate? Is that all based on iSCSI and connection 
uh, attachment and detachment. Okay, so uh, the the communication between the TGT, which is our use for our um, front end SCSI framework, is TGT going to expose our SCSI target, and uh, that's us, that that SCSI target internally connect to our Longhorn engine and uh, through a Unix domain socket. We in fact this one is not efficient at all, so we are going to change that in the future. Okay. But, Currently, it's working this way. So that's TGT front end expose uh, iSCSI target, and that iSCSI target, we're using uh, the iSCSI admin on the host to talk to that iSCSI target, which also, in, in fact, exists in the same host and, uh, and uh, expose the block device there. And also, this, this front end is one part we think is most overhead, one of the most overhead coming from. But uh, the currently the performance of long run is uh, it's not bad, and uh, so we are more focusing on the stability and the usability at the moment. But we definitely think a lot of things can be done to improve this front end. Um, we had another front end before, which is called the TCMU, which is the the Linux uh, SCS target in kernel, which was called LIO before. So TCMU is going. You can expose a block device directly through TCMU. I also have contributed a few kernel patches to the TCMU to make to make the speed much faster because previously it's due is uh, it's due the read write in the synchronized way, so that's basically um, so that's not really to be production use. But uh, in the end, we decide to go with the TGT because it's, uh, uh, we we the the patches in the kernel. If you want to patch kernel, it takes years to reach downstream like uh, Ubuntu distributions. So we cannot, we don't want to create a barrier for user to entry at that point. And also any spark you found in the kernel will take many years, um, at least many months to reach to the uh, downstream distribution. So we decided that, okay, we just go with the user space solution here and make sure more user has accessibility to the long horn. Completely agree. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Actually, I have to drop off, but uh, I, I look forward to more of this. Yeah, in, yeah, was, yeah. In fact, this is basically the last technical one, so no worries. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I think we're we're coming to the end of the time. I, thanks, Shane, for um, for all of this presentation. This has been great. Um, it's probably worth. I think maybe we can schedule um, uh, a short follow-on call, um, and I'll get in touch with. Okay. Yeah. So. cover today. All right. Um, but uh, but thanks again, everyone, and um, um, and, and obviously feel free to uh, to uh, ask uh, any questions on the on the Slack channel as well. Take right. care, guys. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.